Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to our regular Monday talk uh, for Rotary Kilkenny. We're joined today by uh, John Hayes, who is better known perhaps as the special branch man, and that has nothing to do with uh, Gardaí or somebody knocking on your door late at night. In fact, he's more likely to carve a door for you uh, than to knock on it. John uh, was uh, introduced to us by our member Roger Ryan, uh, who is joining us today as well. And uh, yeah. a lot of people may have seen some of John's work if they happen to be in uh, in the Waterford area uh, and indeed beyond. John, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having us, lads. It's a pleasure. And uh, I hope you enjoy what I'm about to kind of talk to you about. Um, first off, anyway, my name is John Hayes and I'm a wood carver, um, chainsaw sculptor. Um, I started off in my early days as, as um, a joiner, um, working, making your stairs and your doors, but always had a draw to be uh, brought to creative stuff. Um, I was a jack of all trades and kind of master of none. I kept wanting to kind of, I felt I really wanted to do something, but never quite could put my finger on it. So I got involved in spree and um, parades, Dublin parade and so forth. Um, but during that, what I, what I didn't realize was I was actually getting experience in worlds that now have combined with the special branch and the Guardian project um, that I have a, a better, I'm ready for it now. I wouldn't have been ready for it in the days when I was young and thought, you know, I need an opportunity. It was actually, it was the, as the experience came, and that was a funny kind of experience. If, if you just pop up the first slide, you, you'll see how it kind of began the, the earlier works. Um, the Guardian project is, is where I'm going to lead you to. And what I'm, I'm talking about is where I started from and how I ended up with this idea and now concept that's going forward. And um, if you just go on to the next slide, Adam, thank you. Um, I started out, as you can see in, in, in the picture, I have a small chainsaw. The chainsaws range from anywhere from uh, four foot down to six inches. So they're like a set of chisels. And um, in some of the pictures that are in there, our community works, but uh, the one where I'm holding the, the trophy, uh, it was a San Maguire for all of those who didn't get a chance to win the, that one. We carved that at a quick carve um, just to show how quick you can turn a piece of timber into a trophy. Um, and we've done that because it was in Dublin at a fair in Dublin. The other photographs below are the World Championships, um, which, which, which I've competed in now for the last uh, three years. Well, last year was a no-no, but um, you, can go, you can take down that slide for a second, Adam. Um, and the idea of them pieces uh, where the little child is rocking, that was a moving piece. You could actually, uh, the child, uh, it was all to do with going for a walk with your parents or your grandparents. And the idea is I wanted to take a sculpture from a single log. So the center piece where the girl is actually uh, standing there, and that rocks. And I literally cut that out like a T out of a full log and then put it, reassembled it back together. You have two days to do the event. And um, so you start with a, a log and you have to create a piece of art. The second one where you see a hound was actually the Coo Cullen story of the ball that Slither being hissed into the, the hounds and the pitcher who tells that whole story. That was the World Championships. I ended up finishing fourth and um, just off the podium by one point. So we didn't quite make it to the top, but I was hoping last year we get a bit closer. Adam, you can take down that slide there, please. Next one. No, you can just take that one down for a second and I'll just go back oh. to my own face. Thank you. Um, you stop sharing. And, yeah, that's it. Yeah, perfect. So in general, I started out as um, a joiner, built parades, and then by accident found this uh, niche market. But I fell in love with the idea first and, and, and the idea of being a carver. And then I... As, as the value of people started coming along and asking me for commissions, I realized, wow, people really like this. They have an affinity with it. And I think it's to do with the texture of wood. You know, you like touching wood and, and feeling it and, and it has a solidness to it. So the people that I work with became very apparent in how I started to learn and develop. Tidy Towns Committees, for example. Now you can put up that next slide, uh, Adam, please. Um, the tidy towns committees, different people would come and look at their local areas. Um, the photographs that are in front of you have, have kind of 
all to do with tidy towns. The, the very first one that is is the Norwegian ambassador, and that's a descendant of the the king of Norway, and we carved him. Um, and we stuck him on the side of a building as a photo opportunity to see could a, a piece of art become interactive and be a way of kind of social media working um, from other people. So they would take their photograph, share it on their social media, and you would have an instant advertisement for your business, um, but also you kind of brought a bit of life to it. You have the um, Liz Moore Tidy Towns Committee in the second photograph was to do with uh, Robert Boyle, um, and the bishop down there. So we recreated that story. But again, it came from the local lads and worked together to create a sculpture. And um, the three faces were to do with um, young people going through leaving school and their expressions. And what we actually done with them faces was on the back of them faces, we have what's going on inside their minds. We got another artist to paint. So the expression of the boy, you see there's a zip across his lips. So young teenage boys weren't able to speak, um, but they had a lot going on in their head. They just, the second one is the person anxious about her leave insert. The third one is to do with when their, their Facebook profile is put out into the world. So they put out a certain vision of who they are, um, but what's going on in the back is they're actually, social media can be a bullying experience. Um, and down below then you have the dragon and uh, Ku Cullen. Again, done by Tidy Towns committees. Now, what's beautiful about the, the Tidy Towns committees, you can just go back to the full screen again with everybody, Adam, thank you. What was lovely about the, the Tidy Towns committees is you, you get to see what's actually within that area um, and, and the people that actually get onto the councils and are looking to make their, their communities better. And what that does for me is it gives me an idea of a story. So um, if we can go on to the next slides, the making of a story um, and actually taking a piece. So what I would do is say, this was for a Gwail skull and it needed to be an interactive piece that would bring a little bit of kind of fun to the school. Um, and so we talked about the storyteller and the idea being that the kids would go out and the teacher would sit in this chair and just outside of this chair, I created a big kind of arch seating area for the students to sit, the young kids to sit. And this one tooth character that we designed um, and we brought to life, the teacher would go out and leave a book with one tooth earlier in the day and then say to the young kids, let's see what one tooth has for us today. And it could be a history book, a ge geography book. And it was a way again of creating a space um, and bringing a story of this storyteller. That that's why he had big ears so that he would, uh, he heard all the stories and he would bring them back to the kids. And there's a one kid just sitting up on his shoulder, you'll see. Um, and that was just to kind of give him the idea that he's friendly. He's a friendly giant, uh, your BFG type of idea. Um, you can go on to the next one there, Adam, please. And that was, as I said, um, the, the community side of it. But to kind of get that experience, as I said, I traveled the world. And again, Scotland, the US, Japan, Australia, all of these, once I kind of made it into the, 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 the hop guys, the beautiful thing about it is, the competition becomes a little bit of a side uh, track. It's actually more to do with um, the learning experience, the techniques from the Japanese. If anybody's into woodwork um, and you've had the chance to operate with chisels, I had never worked with chisels uh, to the degree of only mortising out a lock out of a, a door for your, your, your back of your front, <laughs> front of your house, that type of thing. But to use chisels to carve faces is a, is a technique that you have to learn. And the key to it is going with the grain. And I used to be fascinated by the Japanese and some of the top guys in the world of how the finish they could get with a chainsaw. It was actually like a sanded finish. Um, and I used to have to carve it and then sand it with grinders and stuff. And when I got lessons from the number one Japanese, Kadama is his name, I spent a couple of weeks with him teaching me chisel work. And what it done actually was it taught me to read a tree. So I could actually see the way the grain would, would move through the tree. And by you following it with the chisel, you get a clean stroke. And then when I applied that with the chainsaw, so I just don't cut with the chainsaw now, I actually feather and go with the grain. And all of a sudden you have a sanded finish. And uh, that, was, that was real interesting. I learned some funny things about, about that. Um, 
the first thing I taught myself to get better was to know I was a fool, to realize I was stupid. And I, and I don't mean that in, in, in a condescending way. It, it, it was, if, if I think I know everything, I can't learn anything. So when I saw the, the top guys in the world, um, my whole thing was to um, learn from them. So I would copy what they did. And at the first world championship event, I ended up alongside Kadama, who was the world number one. So I went, oh, no, no matter what I do here, I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to look bad. But actually, it had the opposite effect. It, it allowed you to uh, learn and see one of the best in the world. And so that's what I took forward. And uh, one of the things he told me was, in your 20s, you're full of enthusiasm, but you need to find somebody uh, that is established in business, has experience, um, and stay with them and learn from them for the next, you know, find out what they're good at and learn from them. And when you get into your, your 50s, you should take on somebody that was similar to, to that person you were and pass on your knowledge. And then you, 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 you can watch and enjoy what you've created. That was his philosophy. And I kind of thought it was nice. And there was a wisdom in it. Um, and then the other thing was, how do you know if you love what you're doing? It was one of the questions I used to kind of ask myself. And I think it was uh, when I wasn't doing it, when I wasn't getting paid to do it. And when I also, um, you know, was just lying out, sitting out, sitting in the sun. And I was still trying to figure out what I would do as far as sculpture. Um, that was, that's when I realized you love something. If you're doing it when you're not getting paid for it, I suppose. Uh, you can go on to the next one, Adam. Thank you. Um, I started off doing large sculptures. Um, and it was funny because nobody had been doing them in Ireland. And I was trying to take trees that were long established. These are some that I've worked on and I'm still working on. Uh, the, the one um, on the left-hand side was in the Haven Hotel in Dunmore. And it was a tribute to um, his late dad who loved having sessions in, in the, uh, the actual hotel. He would take out a bower on and put on a red hat. And that's the character standing on top of the big nose. And he would get the session playing. And if you were a piano player, uh, keyboard player, you know, um, fiddle, bowerons, you would start a session in the Haven and have, a, I'm sure maybe some of you even <laughs> are there. Um, and then the other, the, the one in the middle is actually a tree that had fallen um, in, in an estate in Dublin. And it's, it has Napoleon history there. So we're creating um, the blast from the root as if it was blown out the end of the cannon. And that's going to become a centerpiece. We've since now made steel and old fashioned wheels i just put them on to scale it at the time and uh, that's going to be getting unveiled in the next couple of months please god and people will get to enjoy it you can go on to the next one adam which is the big idea these big old pieces started leading me to how could i make a piece that would have an effect uh, beyond waterford and um, my local area and here's a project that i worked on you can play that adam thank you Longest wood sculpture in the world has arrived in Waterford. The 23 metre long Viking sword was made by a local man and is expected to attract thousands of visitors to the city next year. Dawn breaks on Ireland's oldest city as the longest Viking sword ever built is brought past Reginald's Tower. The Viking replica boat and carefully manoeuvred onto Bailey's New Street in the heart of the Viking Triangle. Like a Bayou tapestry, only in wood, the length of the trunk is divided into panels that tell the story of the coming of the Vikings to Ireland and to Waterford. It's the brainchild of local artist John Hayes and his colleague James. This is a project has took nearly a year now to come to getting it here today. It's a big moment for everybody, me and all the team. Um, it, it basically, uh, we started off in a forest, baiting down nettles, found a tree. It's uh, over 70 six feet long. It's the longest wooden Viking sword in the world telling the history of the Vikings. The Douglas fir tree was sourced from Balnamona, where it fell in a storm. To show that he hadn't felled a tree, John left the gnarled roots on, and the result is a thing of beauty. Um, it's suitably near, of course, Reginald's Tower, of course, one of the most famous Vikings. He was king of all the Vikings of England and Ireland. So at a time, I suppose, when Britain is leaving the European Union, we can go back 1100 years to a time when, when we had a king who was king of Waterford and also king of York. So it was another union between England and Ireland at the time. The longest wood sculpture in the world is now on view in Waterford and will add to the many attractions in and around the historic Viking Triangle. 
as a rejuvenated city celebrates by looking to the future and celebrating its past. Damien Tiernan, RT News, Watford. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, so you can just go back to the whole share screen, Adam. Be cool. Um, uh, that was that. That was my first um, kind of where what I had learned from all the small sculptures working with the communities and stuff. The reaction, and the idea was to take an inan inanimate object, give it a personality, and um, create the story again. Have 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 a, a, sto a strong story at the back of it, um, and then show it and leave people enjoy the making of it so we documented the making of it i brought it to the national plowing to break the world record and it generated its own publicity in the end and what actually happened was it um it took on a personality of its own and how that came about was when dublin council uh, one of our members came and said could i can we buy this sword and i went well it's funny you said this sword because i said i can make you another one and they went no but that's the one that's the first one and and that's when it dawned on me that you, you can you can make a massive difference by creating a big idea. Now the problem with it was trying to sell that idea to the different individuals within councils and planning applications and all these type of things. Um, you were talking to an engineer, so the core of the idea was good. I knew I had had an idea that a, a big object telling history would work. Um, but how did I explain that to an engineer? Then how did I explain it to the architect? How did I explain it to the lads in the historic? Each time I had to speak in a language that they understood, um, but necessarily never moved away from the core idea. And the bit, that has led us to this project we're working on now, which is the Guardian project. And it's for the whole of Ireland, really, and majorly for the Southeast. Um, I looked into tourism and what we were lacking down here. And I have... I came to the conclusion that building your own table, they always get us fighting with ourselves in Kilkenny and Wexford and the whole lot of us. Meanwhile, while they're all sitting in Dublin happy because we're all knocking each other down. My philosophy was that the southeast of Ireland is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I needed something that hasn't been built. And I looked around architecture and went, what was the last thing was built by us at this generation and a new generation? It's back 700 years ago. We celebrate our castles, like the beautiful castle in Kilkenny and our Reginald's Tower and all of these things. But we need to actually start building stuff that we are proud of that will be hopefully here in years to come. And that was the Guardian project. Um, Adam, would you like to just put up some of the images of, of the Guardian project? He is basically going to be uh, um, our Statue of Liberty. Um, he stands nearly 86 uh, meters tall. Um, and we have gone through, so if you just want to the next picture, Adam, I'm working on this with over nearly six years or so. Um, the idea is he, he comes from um, the character Dogda. But funnily enough, I didn't know anything about Dogda when I started creating this character. I felt he was from the roots of Ireland. He was to represent who we were and what we were and has always been. The word guardian represents the gatekeeper, the watcher. Um, so I created this character. Um, and started building and then uh, working with a professor in uh, Trinity, we, we went back, he had done a master's on uh, historical mythology and, and, and our, uh, history and combined the two stories and we found great links between actual people and legends. And we, I brought that to life within this. It, you can see that was some one of the first drawings I done of him. And then I started building them in a 3D virtual world so that we could get an idea of scale. And he's changed again and changed again over the last five and a half years. He started out at looking at a sculpture that was only probably 60 feet. And now after all the research I've done and traveled the world looking at various sites and what makes a region change is you have to actually make a world attraction. You can't be the same as somebody else. You, if you are going into a market that has um, talented brands already established, be it Dublin and our Galways at the moment and so forth, and Kilkenny have done a fantastic job, but us as a unit down here in the southeast, we have some of the greatest things, but we just don't have a signpost to tell us that this area with a 100 mile region has some of the greatest qualities, and that's what this character is. He's the signpost for the southeast. He's the gatekeeper. You can go on to the next drawing, Adam. We started developing them then and breaking them down 
every element of them has been broke into an historical story. For example, the helmet will be telling the story of how they made their way around the world using the stars. The designs within the helmet represent that. The actual front nose piece and the various pieces come down the side are to do with your stone hinge, your old um, uh, you know, stone areas, all these things, the chains that they represent, uh, the beard and so forth. Um, tiles and shields to do with all the clans from all around Ireland and um, will, will make up his curls at the back of his head. And um, you can go on to the next one, Adam. Um, to give you an idea of scale, if you look in the mid area there, you will see kind of silhouettes of, of people. That's the scale of what, what this character is. Um, again, because he represents all of us, um, this, the piece of jewellery around his shoulders represent the sun and the moon. And the spiral in the centre of his belly represents the ploughing of the land. And the, the belt is the three ridge, rivers merging. So every element down to his gown, you can go on to the next one, Adam. Each part represents um, a story within Irish culture and who, who we are and what we are and what we stand for. Um, you can click the next one, Adam, please. That's it there, John. Next. Oh, is it? It's actually the video next, so we, we can just go back to full screen there. Well, good. So, um, from a carver, I suppose, to creating a world um, for, for, for everybody, is after being a, a nice journey. Um, I'll finish with the, the video, but if anyone has any questions, I know I just kept talking there because I, I finally got a bit excited. But um, yeah, the, the idea, as I said, I started out with a cup of tea at, 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 my, at this very uh, table and thought, you know, art sometimes is kind of used as a, a way of being pompous and, 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 and you know, have a, oh, he's, he's mysterious. But for me, it's about people. It's about a reaction from a person, making an emotion. I do a lot of memorial pieces and I get to work with families and various people to, from, from pets to, to loved ones. And you, you would think that it, it, it has a, you know, a funny, it's not art to them. It's actually means so much. Um, and that's a, that's a huge thing for me, I have to say. And I just brought that to the level of the Guardian and started looking at us and went, why, why, why do we all kind of not go for it? The worst thing you can do is fail. So that's my philosophy. And uh, that's what my dad and my grandfather especially passed on to me. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I always expect to go into a meeting and get told no. Um, and my job is to find a way to just take away them no's. When I walked into our city manager with the various ideas that I've shown you, um, I got loads of no's. Um, I'm after losing something here now. Hello? Yeah, oh, you're still there. I'm still there, but I can't see for some reason. I just, yeah. I don't want to press that now. But um, yeah, it, it, it was a case of, I spoke a language to him of this enthusiastic, creative person was going to make this thing and he had no idea what it was. So I got, well, I, I don't know if it'll work, John. I don't know if it's cost effective. Will it have the effect it's going to have? So I went off and got the research and uh, brought back to say, well, you know that no that you said was going to be a problem. I've got rid of three of them. Now we've only two left. And it worked. And the sword proved that it has took a long time for certain kind of individuals to not to accept that you can be scared of something. Um, and it, it was very much a, a case of I had to wait for them to come and finally get the idea because it's great to have an idea, but it has to work financially for the accountant. It has to work engineering for, for the engineers. It has to work for the architects. It also has to work for more importantly, the community. And it doesn't take from uh, all the good stuff that we've been developing for the last 10 years, be it our castles and our walkways and everything. So the idea that I've developed is the traffic plan for the people and the visitor experience is all to do with how we get you through and then what do we do next? And that's where I think it, it has proven it's, it's worked when it's, it's been sent off. The business plan has been given to so many different uh, people to basically take a part and it has stood up to it. And they are actually so surprised 
it's it's the same it, it, so just to give you an idea there's a place called sterling and it has a I can't see, by the way, so I'm just looking at the blank screen. I hope you're still there. Um, the, the idea is that uh, the Kelpies in Scotland, it was an area, Stirling, and, and, and uh, it was being passed through for years and years. Everyone was heading up to the highlands of Scotland. And uh, Scott, uh, a local artist, built these two fantastic horses which rep represented, he used to pull the uh, boats along the canals. And the council underestimated it so much that within a year, they had to build a 5 million visitor center. It's created over 7,000 jobs. Um, the growth in, in, in the hotel business alone uh, was over 600% in two years. It has cracked over a million visitors uh, within six months. It was just, um, but it was the business plan of that that actually, I suppose, was the hard part for me. Um, the visitor experience and what I'd like to experience as a family and with uh, my friends was how I kind of designed it. But then I had to go into making it into a business. So that was that was the thing. I'm going to see how I can get back your faces. I, I don't know. If you go to view. view uh, okay. Anyway, we're, we can still see you, John. OK, that's fine. I, I can yeah. I can go ahead. So if you have any questions, lads, that you'd like to know about chainsaw or sculptures or I'd be, I'd be happy to take that. Yeah, I, I just have one question to start off, uh, John. Um, you mentioned that you could read a tree, but are there particular trees that are more suitable for the work that you do? Yes, absolutely. Um, your, our native trees here, obviously oak, ash is not a good tree to carve because it just splits. So if you're doing someone's face, um, especially so, real detailed work, um, you, you, you look for cedar is a fantastic wood because it has a great resin in a lovely color but it actually is really soft and and has a high density and um, lime is lovely to carve but it has a tendency to crack so you you will carve your face uh, roughly and um, if i'm doing a portrait and then you will um leave it settle and then you will actually take some of the off cuts you have and repiece them into the face where the cracks would appear so uh, the tree, but what's a, a, a brilliant tree actually, and people would consider it a kind of, is Matacarper. So it's from the cedar family. It was kind of planted here back about 500 years ago. And you would see them in churchyards, they're very big, but they break off. It's not an actual single trunk, but it kind of, they intertwine. It can be very beautiful or cause you big headaches when you get into the middle of them, you find there's nothing there, <laughs> which has happened in the numerous times. And what about uh, coniferous trees? Are they of any use? Because they they tend to fall when there's uh, when there's a storm. Yeah, the root base is not good on them. Um, they are. They all, every every timber can be carved. Um, but if if when I started out, I was making mushrooms and little small fairy houses, and that kind of wood is okay for that stuff. It's great. You can just knock out. You know, they hold the shape enough, and you can get a nice little finish on them. Um, but once I started getting into uh, more detail and, and also the preserving of the trees, um, what, there was only two carvers in the country at the time. And one had only kind of started roughly a little bit before me, um, uh, Will Fogarty, a lovely, very nice carver, very smooth carver, um, and Richard Clark from Mead. Richard was very much based in historical stuff, he loved doing mythological Ireland, uh, river gods, that type of stuff. They were kind of a little bit, everyone was a little bit scared to, to share what they knew. And we, and we were only finding how to do this by watching um, internationals on YouTube and stuff. So you were looking in the background to see what kind of tools they used. Um, and that kind of spurred me on then to go international because I kind of had come so far and found myself, okay, I'm, I'm not improving, I, I'm learning, but not. So I went to my first international, well, it took two years to qualify. Um, and then the, the level then, and then I learned more about trees. And, and that's, as I said, about the grain, Learn, learning to read the grain was a huge fact. And I'm sitting, I'm still, I'm practicing. And it's sometimes you just see it and sometimes you, you have to stop a little bit, but it's the difference in, I could never understand how the Japanese, the Germans were really technically good. And um, the Canadians were getting this finish and I was losing hours and hours of time. And it was just pure down to technique and, and knowledge, I suppose, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And as you've grown in this skill, the more that you've learned, I love the idea of uh, the looking at your own age uh, as uh, looking at how young people learn a craft and how as people grow older, they look for a young person to pass on that skill. In your own case, the Guardian project is a mammoth project. Is it actually going to go ahead? Yeah, well, for the last five and a half years, I've, I've been battling the North Keys. I've been battling uh, local people wanting to, um, I suppose, just make a name for themselves. The ego gets in the way. And the biggest problem with, with, with these kind of projects is, isn't the actual projects. Lots of people's have, a lot of people get great ideas. Um, the problem is they get in each other's way. Um, purely ego or um, financial gain or just just they just like being that person the one thing I have noticed about I started off in committees with a local playground here and as I went, got confidence to be able to deal with people and, and put these things together and it wasn't it's just confidence in, in my ability but what I started to look at was who what I didn't have and who would be the best person for me to work with and I started just saying, well, look, I tell you what, I know I can't come into ye, uh, say in the early days of trying to develop this project, I couldn't afford to have engineers and architects. The idea would have never gotten any kind of traction. So what I said was, I tell you what, I'm not looking for anything, only your expertise. Can you have a look at this and see if I'm right engineering wise? Can you look at this marketing wise? Can you look at this, um, you know, say environmentally? And bit by bit, I, they started to kind of get what I was talking about, that it wasn't an individual thing. It was the, the big idea takes people to be good at what, know what you are good at and, and not change uh, when, when you don't understand that element of the project. Don't worry about it. That's not what you're here for. Um, but a lot of people will, if, if, if you're in, in a, a thing, I have this theory. Um, what happens is you get guys at the back of the college um, back at a class in college as they're doing their university degrees or whatever and it's architecture the, the top of that class goes off and sets up their own firms they're headhunted they do things you get the guy that gets his qualification more often than not that's the guy that ends up the first fellow you meet at the counter and he you come in as john and he's an engineer but he's not like we we have brilliant uh, soccer players and bad soccer players we also have brilliant engineers and bad engineers we all have the badge and good carvers and bad carvers I found what happened was you had a guy across from you that was scared of the idea. His friend that he went to college with would take this thing and, and, and be able to really get it. But he's not going to imply his friend because that puts him under pressure. That was one of the things at the very start that I noticed that there was the, the door closed because the idea was too big. It was frightening. And so my job then was to kind of to just show him the common sense of it. And uh, very much so, I suppose, with the North Keys, you would see that they had a half a billion pounds kind of flown in from the Arabs or um, the investors. And then they decided, what could we make for that instead of going the other way? What do we need? And then um, how do we get the money for it? And that was the approach I took. Now, it has come to that area where with Corona and everything, we all have to look at the world differently. People are not going to be going back into offices and um, general space that we're going to meet in. It'll have to be hubs. It'll have to have an atmosphere that a professional can go down and have meetings and stuff like that. It's, it's shopping centers. It's back to what Kilkenny kept, really, to be honest with you, in the streets, atmosphere. Um, that's the beauty. Uh, my mom goes shopping up there. And that's what Waterford forgot. And it's what a lot of the general, and we've been too busy fighting about that. So... That's it, yeah. That's what I've tried to get to now with the Guardian is a single clear idea that benefits. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's at the stage where the announcement is getting made. We're going in for the, the actual full planning process is kind of on its way now. And that was that was good to hear. But I, I just always kind of when I stand on it, please God, and with all of ye and everybody else, and we can have a nice cup of tea and um, then I'll believe it's there. But an idea is only good if we use it and I just keep pushing. You, you, you can't make it happen in, in a couple of minutes. There's so many obstacles, uh, be it councillors, politicians looking to get their name in lights, stand alongside a Coke bottle, whatever you, you want. You, you still have that guy that turns up at the funeral and walks the, the long way around so everybody can see him. 
Um, but I'm not concerned about that because they exist and they'll always will. The only thing I can do is what I, I do. And if I keep bringing that information to you, you actually do get down the road. Um, so, yeah, it's making sense to all the people that can make these decisions and then decisions are starting to be made. For me personally, it's about creating something for, for, for people to kind of look at and realize that if I got a chance, I'm actually not bad at this. Yeah. And that's kind of me, me philosophy. A lot of really talented people don't get a chance. I was very lucky to get the chance. I was on a back to work scheme. Um, my wife is in the orthodontist world um, and she was keeping us going. And I felt very much that I wasn't able to, uh, you know, do what I, I'm supposed to do as a dad and, and, and a, a husband. And I found this um, carving world that all the talents that I, all the stuff I thought I'd wasted my time on over the years was now coming into an age where actually, John, you're ready now. Um, because imagination was never my problem. Business and all the stuff that goes with it and ego and all them things I had to deal with always annoyed me. And instead of them annoying me now, I just go, well, okay, that's the way that person is. It's no disrespect to me. It's just that's the way they deal. And maybe I come across a bit too strong at times in, in the meetings and, and they're, they're intimidated or, or just don't get me. And I kind of realized that same, same saying that when we all realize this, not everyone likes us. So <laughs> that's okay, you know. Um, so that's been my little goal is first know when I walk into a room, I know what I know. And it's, there's nothing wrong with not knowing something. Um, but there is something wrong with letting on you do. Because um, that's what stops these ideas. So I really, yeah, as far as I can tell you, I'm, I'm a lot further down the road five and a half years ago. And I'm not selling it anymore. We're just figuring it out how we're going to deal with that. That's Great. the view. Great. Well, the best of luck uh, with it. And let us know how you get on with the planning process. Uh, it'd be great to have uh, a, a, such a, literally a monumental uh, tribute to the people of Waterford and indeed the... Well, it's actually the people of Ireland, to be honest. It's, yes. it's, and as a Kilkenny man is my uh, design partner, uh, Roger O'Reilly, who's based up oh, in yes. Kilkenny. He's a fantastic artist. And indeed. the illustrations that you have been looking at some of them illustrations are done by that man. He's a very talented. Yes, his work on Irish lighthouses is particularly. Exactly, strong. that's the very man. So he's my, uh, himself, a guy called Chris Wood, who's uh -huh. uh, fantastic. Yeah, he's actually, he's a phenomenal artist um, and lovely guy. And uh, I'm very lucky. But I actually met all these people through what I call the small door. Um, it wasn't a big one. Um, they were kind of chance meetings. And how I speak to you today is through a chance meeting that I, I met your colleague um, as at, at, uh, we were going to see, um, we were learning how to, to pour uh, brass um, statues. And we started chatting and I had a lovely chat with him. And I think that's what these things are about. It's the small door. It's the chance meeting is actually the big opportunity. Everybody looks for the big, the big door and the big praise. I think you just get on with doing what you do best and meet good people and recognize them when you see them right. and make an effort towards them. Yeah. And uh, I don't try to invest in people that you don't get anything back from. I, I think if you're just yourself and I can spot that in you. So I have a little saying, my head, my heart, my belly. So if I make a decision with my head, it's um, sometimes <laughs> a little bit wrong. If I make it with my heart, it's emotion. So I wait till it gets to that little spot in my belly and I say, actually, you know what? This person, this lady, this man, is, is worth me investing and, and uh, things. So again, to your colleague, when he asked me, would, would I like to speak? I hope I come across okay. And that's Absolutely. Um, what I get from this kind of thing I'm is just, networking and getting a chance to, you know, just- I'm going to me. ask if any other people who are joining us today have any questions for John. Yeah, I, I've got one if I can chip in Ian. Please, Robert. Yeah. Uh, John, I was wondering, how do you preserve these statues? Because, you know, you're doing something of this scale and you want it to last for donkey's years and wood isn't going to last outside. Yes, exactly. It, it's, it's one of the things that uh, the international side of it kind of helped me with. And um, what started to happen was the sculptors, you would, your tree would get damaged, you would cut off the dangerous branches and be left with the, the, the main stump of the, the tree and then I would carve it. Um, but you're still taking moisture from the ground. So it's like a sponge, it's rotten from the inside out and eventually that sculpture has gone. So first thing I, when I got to America was they, if the tree is within say 10 foot tall, 
um, they would actually cut the, down at the bottom of it and separate the root from the, the tree, put it back in on, on like these tiny little shims. So there was a small degree. Then they would inject it then with a, a bug repellent. It would look very similar to um, if any you ever used a glue gun um, and, and you would uh, drill a 10 mil hole and you put this in. So it's all about one of my tricks is, is engine oil. Um, a clean engine oil, I will buy a big, huge drum of it. Uh, I will heat it up with linseed oil and, um, and a penetration oil I put into it. And I will coat that onto the tree. And if you can imagine, the tree is like a sponge and its biggest killer is water and heat. So it, it rains, the tree swells up, all the cells fill up with water. Then the heat comes along the shrinks and it's that constant movement that causes the cracks. So what you're trying to do is make it as stable as possible. So water and oil doesn't mix. So once you fill that sponge up and you 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 use um, a kind of real, by, by heating it, it absorbs quicker into the timber. So you get a deep penetration. So now you've created a barrier and it won't take in water from the outside and by splitting it on the end. So there's a couple of procedures like that that I'll do um, to, to things. But I, I, I love when there's a shelter, if there's even from sunlight, the sunlight can do huge damage. It can change the color, make them go gray. But yeah, there's some great products on the market now that is making it a little bit easier. But again, I, I keep kind of trying to learn ways of preserving them. That uh, I, my ones are kind of, I, I would kind of say 10 to 20 years the way I'm doing them. But um, yeah, certain timbers, obviously, I, if I come to your house, and I see you have a certain tree. Um, I'm not the type of person that will say, yeah, I carve this and go away. I'll actually tell you, look, you're wasting your money because it'll be gone in two years. And yeah, I think you have to be like that because it's not fair. Because I personally want my sculptures to last as long as they can so people can see them and, and, and enjoy them. But um, yeah, that's it, it is, it is, that's what it is. But compared to, I can bring a statue to life for a local GAA club or something. Um, for money that would normally cost them, you know, they wouldn't be able to afford to get a tribute. And with pieces like that, they are really looked after well, and they can last up to 40, 50 years if you have the right people in the committee looking after them. But a lot of them say, yes, John, I'll do that. Um, I do call around to the sculptures that I really like and make sure that they're looking after them. Actually, with the sword in Waterford now, is, it has, the phone call has gone in to say, lads, come on, we need to give it a face. <laughs> But um, they, they sent me back to tell they told me to send in an invoice to, to uh, what it would cost to bring it back to its former glory. But yeah. my thing with him is like, lads, if you just do a little bit often, it'll last forever and it won't cost you anything dramatic, you know. But um, yeah, that's it. That's the, that's the story. Thank you. I don't know if there's anybody else. I was just going to finish uh, to by first of all thanking uh, John for his marvelously inspiring and I think inspirational story. I was going to finish up with uh, the poem uh, by Joyce Kilmer. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the sweet earth's flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And while a tree in the ground has a limited life, John, through your work, you give it an extended life after what appears to be the tree's death. Thank you very much uh, for your work today and uh, for giving us this really interesting talk. I'll be putting a recording up and uh, so people who weren't able to join us today will be able to look and uh, see what you're doing. And I hope that uh, the Guardian project uh, gets all the approval and support that it needs. And if there's anything that we can do to enhance the work you're doing, uh, please let us know. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. But I'd also like uh, to thank those who were able to uh, join us for the, uh, as we stood, for the passing of the cortege of Mag Smith's uh, funeral. Uh, it was a, a really tragic event that uh, brought uh, Mag's well lived life to an early end and we really sympathize with our fellow member 
Cahill in his really sad, this really sad and tragic time for him and his family. I'd like to say uh, thank you to everybody for joining us and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks time uh, for our next meeting. Next Monday, of course, is a bank holiday Monday. So on Monday, the 10th of May, we'll be with you again. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye now. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, John. Bye. Thank you, lads.